The preacher usually likes to get up in the pulpit so he can look down on his brethren. No, that's not true, but you can sort of look down on the preacher today. You know, it's difficult to know why people don't obey the gospel. I suppose they think they have justification for not doing it for some reason. But people that don't obey the gospel, they're not always mean people. They're not always just trying to be rebellious. They're not necessarily stubborn. They don't want to live a wicked and ugly life before their neighbors. But they just don't obey the gospel. I want to talk to us today about maybe one of the main reasons that a lot of people don't obey the gospel. <coughs> I may have told you about a man that I knew many years ago in another city where I preached. His wife was a member of the church and rarely but occasionally he would come and visit with her. He was a very wealthy man. And I would try to get, uh, make arrangements to have an occasion to sit down and just talk with him about his soul, about salvation. But he always had some sort of reason or business excuse that he couldn't meet with me and they just kept putting me off. And I knew he was just dodging me. So one day I just went to his office and I walked in and there was his secretary and I said, I want to see Mr. So-and-so. She said, well, he's busy. I said, I'm sure he is. But you go tell him I want to see him and I want to see him just for five minutes. And if I stay any longer after five minutes, it will be his request. So she went back and he allowed me to come in for five minutes. And I tried to reason with him as to why he didn't want to talk about spiritual matters. As I said, he was a very wealthy man, a manufacturer. He had a big bay window there. He could look out out that window. He could see his plant. He could see his fleet of trucks. He just had it. And his reason was, says, Mr. Boyd, I've got more than everybody in that congregation probably put together. What do I need the church for? Well, I tried to reason with him that that wasn't what the church was about and these material things, some of these days were all going to be gone and he would be too. Then what? But still, he, I didn't make any impression on him. I, I didn't, he wouldn't admit the fact that he had any need for Christ and for the church. And I left there very downhearted because I thought that was so pitiful that he thought that way. But I suppose a lot of people don't obey the gospel because they don't admit that they need the Christ. They don't believe they need forgiveness. They don't believe they're lost. You know, in the book of Romans we've been studying, Paul makes it clear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isaiah says that's what separates us from God, isn't it? He said, for all have sinned, Romans 5 and verse 12. We read over here in 1 John chapter 1, and this is about even Christian people. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now in the Bible, we do read of some people who admitted they had sinned. I'm thinking now of the man Achan, and the Bible student is acquainted with this as an individual. He was with Joshua and the Israelites when they crossed the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, 
They came against the first obstacle, the fortified city of Jericho. Well, do you know that God gave instructions as to how to keep that city that he would give them? But he told them now, the spoils of the city you do not take for yourself. They belong to the treasury of the Lord. Well, they won a great victory, of course. The walls fell down. They took the spoils, but Achan, he evidently was a covetous man. He saw some things that he wanted, and he took them, and he buried them in his tent. He buried them so nobody would know he had gotten them. But I wonder what good did he think those things were going to do him if they were going to be buried in his tent? That seems so illogical. Well, the people of Israel then went up against the little city Ai, and they suffered a defeat. Joshua approached God about it, and God says, there's sin in the camp. Well, after a process of investigation, it was discovered that Achan had taken of things that did not belong to him. And when it was brought to his attention and he was convicted of it, he said, I have sinned. Well, as a result of his transgression, he and all of his was destroyed. Now, that was a very severe punishment, but that was due to his transgression of the will of God. He didn't deserve to keep what he had wrongfully taken. He admitted he had sinned, but he nonetheless did not escape punishment for his crime. Then there was another man in Old Testament history. He was the first king of Israel, King Saul. Saul was commissioned by God to go and to destroy the nation of Amalek. Now the Amalekites, you will recall, had been the people that when Israel had crossed the Red Sea, they raided the people of Israel, made war against them. And that's when Joshua fought against them and defeated them. But God said, I'm going to punish your people because of this. So time had come for that punishment. And God told Saul to go down and you destroy everything there. And all their properties, all their flocks, all their herds, all their people, you wipe them out. Now you may think that was a very strong punishment, and it was, but these were very wicked, even barbarous people. They deserved the retribution from God because of the kind of people that they were. Saul went down and he won a great victory that day, didn't he? But he didn't obey God. He spared some of the flocks and some of the herds, and he even spared King, the King Agag. And when he returned, he came to the presence of Samuel, and Samuel said, What means the bleeding of these sheep and the lowing of the cattle? Who is this man here, Agag? And Saul said, Oh, the people wanted to save the best of all of these animals because they wanted to use them in sacrifice to God. And that's when Samuel told him, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Folks, that teaches us something. We worship God, but our worship is in vain if we are not willing to obey what God has taught us as to how to live and what to do. And this was about the only occasion where Samuel seemed to be a little bit out of his general character of gentleness and kindness. He took a sword and he hewed Agag to pieces because he did not deserve to live. Saul tried to blame the people, didn't he, because of his transgression, but he was responsible. And when Saul confronted him, he said, I have sinned. And Samuel told him, because of what you've done, the kingdom's going to be taken away from you and from your posterity. 
it's going to be given to another a man after God's own heart but of course that proved to be David David also one time said I have sinned David had sinned in a whole series of sins it was a time when he was had become the king the responsibility of being the king was to lead his people in battle well his men went into battle but he did not lead them he stayed home and while he was home he saw Bathsheba bathing he lusted for her he sent for her he committed adultery with her and it was soon found that she was with child by David well David didn't want the responsibility of, of that child he had done wrong he knew it and so he sent for Uriah then Uriah was one of his soldiers that was out in the battle to come home and he was hoping that he would lie with Bathsheba his wife and then the responsibility would assume to be for the child to belong to Uriah but Uriah didn't cooperate he didn't go to his wife David even got him drunk you know people do a lot of things when they're drunk that they ought not do that's one of the glories of alcoholic beverages and Uriah didn't go to Bathsheba so David still had to get rid of Uriah somewhere or another so he entered into a conspiracy with Joab his captain he said I want you to go to battle and I want you to put Uriah in the forefront and I want you to pull back from him I want you to leave him at the mercy of the enemy and I want him to be killed and that's what happened and after the battle David got a message from Joab and, and David wanted to know about how things had happened he said uh, we won the battle and everything was like you wanted and that meant Uriah was dead well it wasn't long after that that Samuel or Nathan Nathan God's prophet approached David because he was going to convict him of his sin and what Nathan did he told him a rather extended parable that showed David just how wicked he had been and all that he had done if you would turn to your Old Testament with me for a moment to 2 Samuel Brother Colbert scared me to death this morning when he said turn to 2 Samuel I said if that man turns to this chapter I'm done <laughs> but he, he had a different chapter thankfully chapter 12 <clears throat> we read and the Lord sent Nathan unto David and he came unto him and said unto him there were two men in one city the one rich and the other poor the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he bought up and nourished and grew up together with him and with his children and did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter and there came a traveler unto the rich man and he spared to take of his own flock and his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come to him but he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him now notice David's reaction to this David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and he said to Nathan as the Lord liveth the man that has done this thing is surely shall surely die he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing because he had no pity now notice what Nathan said to David thou art the man you know that took a lot of courage for that prophet to do this to come before the king and to condemn him in this fashion but he wasn't hesitant to do it because this was what God sent him to do he said thou art the man and thus saith the Lord God of Israel 
I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the land of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if it had been too little, I moreover would have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And let me just insert right here, David never had another peaceful day as long as he lived. His children were continually against him. They were trying to take his throne. Adonijah tried to take it. Absalom tried to take it. He had trouble with Joab. He had trouble all the rest of his life because of his transgression. And verse 11 says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He added something to his admission that the others had not said. They said, I have sinned. And of course, John tells us in 1 John 3 and verse 4, sin is a transgression of the law. That's the law of God. But David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Oh, he had sinned against Bathsheba. He had sinned against his army. He had sinned against his nation. He had sinned against Joab, bringing him into an evil conspiracy. He had sinned against Uriah. But he realized that all sin is against God. There may be others involved, but whenever one sins, he's in violation of the will of God. And, Nathan, and David said, I have sinned against the Lord. The Lord forgave him of that sin. But we read in the New Testament of a man that made that admission. And you will remember him in Luke chapter 15 in the parable that the Lord told about what we call the prodigal son. The young son who took his inheritance before it really should have been given him went into a far country. He lived in a wicked fashion, spent all of his goods. He wasted it. So finally he found himself feeding swine and eating the same food that the swine did eat. The Bible says he came to himself. He realized what a deplorable state he was in. And he did something about it. He said, I'll go back home to my father. And I'll tell him I've sinned. And I don't deserve to be included as your son. But if you'll just make me as one of your hired servants. So he made the trip back home. That must have been a difficult trip for him to make. He had gone off in such an arrogant fashion and lived such a wicked life, but he was coming back admitting how wrong he had been. And when he came to the Father, he, he admitted just exactly what he said he was going to do. He said, I have sinned. Just make me a servant. The Father wouldn't even let him finish his admission before he rewarded him with um, clothing and shoes and the fatted calf and a feast and all of that. But he said, I have sinned. You know, dear people, nobody makes the turnaround like the prodigal son until they are willing to admit, I have sinned. Now, sometimes people will admit that and still don't turn around. That was one of the troubles with King Saul. That was one of the troubles with Achan. 
And that was the trouble with another New Testament character too named Judas. Judas, you know, he entered into an agreement with the enemies of Christ for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And he betrayed him at an opportune moment. And after a while, when they had taken Jesus, Judas realized that he had done a terrible thing. He had betrayed innocent blood. And he went back to those with whom he had covered, uh, made the covenant, gotten the 30 pieces of silver. He threw the money down at their feet. He said, I have betrayed innocent blood. I have sinned. But the trouble with Judas was that he didn't do anything to correct his sin. He went out and hanged himself. So pitiful. But you know, don't you suspect that there are a lot of people. They don't come to Christ. They don't realize they've sinned. They haven't been taught, I guess, that they have sinned. Or if they've been taught, they just pass it off. They like the life they're living. They want to continue as they are. They don't think they're obligated to do anything even before Almighty God. And they won't admit, I have sinned. He said, oh, that's so disturbing to a person to admit that. That's right. It is. I've never known of a person becoming a Christian that wasn't first disturbed that he needed to be a Christian. He needed to be washed by the blood of Christ and being taught how to be cleansed by the blood, being baptized into Christ, having admitted it, he finally did become a child of God. Even Christians must admit we have sinned. We're not perfect. Baptism doesn't make us perfect. Baptism puts us into a relationship with God where we can pray for the forgiveness of our sins, but we dare not deny that we sin, for if we do, we're saying, God, you're wrong. You're a liar. I don't sin. Oh, but we do. And folks, we need to admit it when we do. And to do that, we have to humble ourselves before God. We cannot approach God in an arrogant fashion, in a self-righteous fashion, as if we don't need anything. Oh, how we need our Savior. We need his love and forgiveness. If there be any here in this group today that's not yet come to Christ, won't you admit the reality? I have sinned. You can't get to heaven that way because Revelation 21 says there's not going to be any unclean thing in heaven. You're going to have to be washed clean of your sin to get to heaven. And if you're a child of God and you have sinned in such fashion that you need to make a public acknowledgement of it, won't you do that today? And if your sin has been privately committed and known between you and God, be humble enough, admit it, I have sinned, and pray for your forgiveness. Heaven is too precious to forget it and fail to obey the Lord. If you are subject to the Lord's invitation this morning, as Brother Tommy leads us in our invitation song, we invite you to come forward.